As we've been looking at the demographics and statistics of charitable estate planning and plan giving, I thought I would end with a bit of a tax wonky actuarial tangent, giving you an example of how knowledge of demographics and statistics can actually be helpful in complex charitable financial planning. So it helps to have a little bit of knowledge of uh, plan giving, fi uh, charitable financial planning to understand this example. But let me go ahead and share with you uh, how this works, even if you're not familiar uh, with this particular uh, scenario. So let me start with an introduction to what's called a charitable remainder trust. Now, in other sections and uh, courses, uh, there are other lectures that go into this in uh, much detail. Uh, but uh, the basic idea of a charitable remainder trust is a donor sets aside an asset, uh, takes payments during life from that asset, uh, and anything that's left over at death goes to the charity. Okay? That's basically how it works. Donor makes this transfer, takes payments during life, anything left at death goes to the charity. Now, that donor gets an immediate tax deduction as soon as the donor transfers something into his or her charitable remainder trust. The reason that the donor gets an immediate tax deduction is because this charitable remainder trust is irrevocable. It's fixed, uh, meaning that the payments during life are f a fixed percentage of whatever is in the trust, or they could be a fixed dollar amount. Uh, and the, uh, and it is, it is irrevocable that whatever is left over is going to go to a charity. Now, in some cases, the donor can switch which charity, but it's, it's gotta be a charity. Okay. Uh, so this is how a charitable remainder trust works. Now, just to keep in mind, charitable remainder trusts are, uh, very tax efficient, uh, for a number of reasons. One, there is no upfront capital gains tax at the sale. So let's suppose you have a donor that was getting ready to retire, uh, was going to sell his business. Uh, maybe his business is worth uh, $10 million. And let's say that $10 million, uh, when the uh, person was going to sell that business, um, that they would get $10 million, but then they'd have to pay uh, capital gains tax on that. Uh, and let's say they're paying both the capital gains tax and the, the net investment income tax, which means they're paying 23.8% at the federal level. Uh, and let's stick them in California, so they're paying uh, another capital gains tax of 13.3%. And of course, uh, they're going to be capped out from being able to deduct that uh, state capital gains tax from the uh, federal tax, so they're just paying it straight up. Uh, so what that means is that that $10 million that they get from the sale of their business, it immediately uh, uh, comes down and, and it's only uh, $6.3 million uh, because of the uh, combined state and federal capital gains taxes. So that $10 million became $6.3 million, and the, the uh, person has to learn how to uh, live off of the $6.3 million that they've got left over right? However, there is an alternative. The alternative is they could take that $10 million asset, put it into their irrevocable charitable remainder trust, and sell it, and the full $10 million stays untouched by capital gains tax, stays in this trust that can be managed by uh, the donor uh, or somebody the donor selects. So what happens is the donor gets payments for life off of the entire $10 million unreduced by capital gains taxes, okay? That's a pretty cool deal for the donor, right? Uh, on top of that, because uh, it's an irrevocable trust that at the end of life is going to make a transfer to some charity, the donor gets an immediate tax deduction for that, okay? Uh, on top of that, uh, you get tax deferred growth uh, inside the charitable remainder trust. So let's say uh, the charitable remainder trust assets are invested in the market and we get a crazy big spike in the market. How much of that? And, and so you get a, a big return in the market. Let's say you sell all of those assets. That's all income. How much is going to have to be paid in taxes on that income while it's in the charitable remainder trust? The answer is none. 
all of that uh, all of that growth is tax deferred. The taxes aren't paid until you actually take money out of the charitable remainder trust. So in that way, it works a little bit like uh, you know a traditional IRA or 401k. There's no taxation that takes place while it stays in the uh, uh, charitable remainder trust. It's only when you pull it out that you pay taxes. So you get tax-free growth on growth on growth in here. Okay, so that, so those are some of the advantages uh, of uh, of this particular instrument. Uh, some of the reasons why uh, folks uh, folks really like them. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons uh, that financial advisors really like these is because number one, instead of managing that you know six point three million dollars that's left over after paying taxes on the ten million, the advisors are actually managing the full ten million. And not only that, the advisors can continue to manage even after the client dies uh, if the charity selected is either a private foundation that the advisor manages or a donor advised fund that the advisor manages. So advisors love these things as well. Uh, it's a great way to increase your assets under management uh, because not only do you have the full $10 million, guess what? You actually have more than $10 million. Why? because you get this massive tax deduction. So all those taxes you were going to have to pay out of your other assets under management, you don't have to pay them now because you've got this massive tax deduction, right? So it just makes AUM go up, up, up. So advisors love these sorts of things. Okay, so that's a just a quick introduction to charitable remainder trusts and uh, why they are attractive. Now, there are a number of reasons why advisors who are not familiar with charitable remainder trusts need to get familiar with charitable remainder trusts. It's not just that they're a super popular tool, but it is a tool that the that the creation peaks in the early 70s. The early 70s is the age group that right now is experiencing uh, getting ready to experience and actually already experiencing a dramatic increase uh, in the uh, in the population. So again, this is the early 70s. Uh, this is showing the increase in the population uh, of those at this peak age for taking out charitable remainder trusts. And we're already starting to see that increase in population, but got a big old honking wave that's coming up ahead. That's the baby boomer wave coming up ahead for this critical age range. Uh, and so this is something useful for advisors to uh, keep in mind because the peak age uh, for using a charitable remainder trust uh, is in the early 70s. Uh, and anything having to do with early 70s, that's a market you want to be in right now. Uh, the second thing is that this uh, particular instrument is much more attractive and it is actually more available uh, to people for some technical reasons um, uh, based upon the minimum charitable gift you can make. Uh, it is more available at higher interest rates. Interest rates today are much higher than they were a few years ago, and so this becomes more available and more attractive. Uh, of course, one of the biggest attractions of using a charitable remainder trust is if you stick an appreciated asset in there, you can sell that asset with no upfront capital gains taxes. This became a bigger deal starting in 2018 because capital gains taxes went up for most people in 2018. The reason they went up is not because the federal rates changed. The federal rates stayed the same. Uh, it is because those state capital gains taxes, and about 80% of the country lives in states that charge state capital gains taxes, state capital gains taxes are, for most people that are going to be uh, in this uh, high net worth category, those state capital gains taxes are essentially no longer deductible. Uh, you, you know, you've got a $10,000 uh, cap for a married couple uh, on these kinds of taxes. They're, they're already capped out just from their property taxes on their uh, on their homes. So, so these things, they were deductible in 2017 uh, at the federal level. Uh, state uh, capital gains taxes are no longer deductible uh, for all practical purposes, which means their effective capital gains tax rates just went up, which means it's a much, much bigger deal not to pay those things uh, up front so you can keep earning money on and keep managing those assets uh, on the full amount unreduced by capital gains taxes. The cost uh, of a charitable remainder trust, uh, you know, if we look at 
what happens in a charitable remainder trust. It's all benefit, 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 benefit. The only cost is this thing, which means at the end of life, uh, whatever's left over goes to charity. Okay, that's the cost. Because the cost of this technique is essentially having to make a charitable gift at the end of life, it's important to note that the upcoming demographics for this age group include a higher level of childlessness and a higher level of education, both of which predict the interest in uh, an actual use of uh, charitable bequests. In other words, the bottom line cost to this technique is something that is going to become more attractive uh, to the upcoming group of the population that reaches the key age group for making this kind of transaction uh, because of their demographic characteristics. So all of those things uh, put together, uh, useful to keep in mind that this all is sort of coming together in a way that suggests that we're going to see a growth in charitable remainder trusts, fairly sustained growth. We're going to see growth in this population. We're going to see growth in the proportion of the population that wants to make a charitable estate gift. We've already seen in 2018 an increase in the net combined capital gains taxes for people who live in states with capital gains taxes because of the state and local tax uh, cap. And we've already seen an increase in interest rates, which make these more available and more attractive. So here's where we get a little bit wonky uh, with some of the uh, some of the different options. So as we understand some demographics and statistics, we begin to understand that charitable remainder trust deductions are dramatically overestimated. In other words, when people make a transfer to their charitable remainder trust, they get a tax deduction immediately for that transfer. That tax deduction is based upon uh, the average life expectancy for a person of their age. So let me clarify exactly what I, I mean by that. So as we go back to uh, looking at the charitable remainder trust, Okay. The charitable remainder trust, a person transfers an asset into the charitable remainder trust, takes payments for life, and then anything left over goes to the charity. Now, these payments for life, the tax deduction that this donor receives when they make that transfer is based upon the idea that they are going to live to exactly their life expectancy. In other words, the amount that's going to go to charity, if their life expectancy, uh, according to the IRS tables, is let's say 10 years, then their tax deduction is based upon the idea that before this goes to charity, 10 payments will come out of it, okay? And then whatever's left over goes to charity. Uh, these 10 payments will be a fixed dollar amount, uh, or they could be a fixed percentage, right? So the tax deduction is based upon this leftover amount that will uh, come out, that's the present value of whatever's left over over here, based upon, uh, these, uh, based upon these payments. So if the person has a 10-year life expectancy, then this tax deduction will be based upon what's left over after 10 annual payments out of this. But if instead of living 10 years, if the person lives 20 years, they're going to get a lot more value out of that charitable remainder trust. And because the charity has to wait for 20 years, uh, their, the present value of what they get is going to be much, much smaller, right? Uh, and in fact, it's possible if these are fixed payments in a charitable remainder annuity trust, it's, it's possible that there could be nothing left over because the person took 10 of these fixed payments instead of 20 of these fixed payments. Okay. So, uh, the bottom line is if a person lives longer, they get more money. The charity waits longer and typically will get less money. Uh, at least in terms of present value, they're going to get a lot less because the person got to take payments for a lot more years than was initially uh, initially projected. 
Okay, so that's the basic idea, uh, and it's the reason why uh, it is such a big deal what the number of years uh, that is uh, calculated as how many years the person is going to get their uh, annual payments. Uh, payments could be annual or semi-annual, monthly, whatever. The deduction is based upon uh, the idea that people who take out charitable remainder trusts will live for the population average life expectancy. Now, this estimation is completely ridiculous for a number of reasons. People that establish a charitable remainder trust uh, are not on average, going to live the population average life expectancy uh, for people of their age for several reasons. One, sick people don't buy annuities. What is this? It's an annuity. Why is this an annuity? Well, think about it. What does an annuity do? An annuity pays for your life. What does this do? You transfer an asset, you get payments during life, right? So the idea here is that this, because this creates uh, payments during life, something that pays you for as long as you're alive, that's an annuity. You don't make this kind of a bet on getting payments during life if you've got a terminal diagnosis, right? If, if you know, look, I've only got two or three years left to live, you don't go buy an annuity and you don't set up an annuity. Whether, and a charitable remainder trust is an annuity. Uh, there's the technical form of charitable remainder annuity trust, which uses that word because it's a fixed dollar payment. But the charitable remainder unit trust, which is a fixed percentage payment, is also an annuity in the sense that it pays you that amount only for as long as you're alive. At least that's how almost all charitable remainder trusts are set up. You could actually set a fixed number of years, but that's very rare. So setting up a charitable remainder trust is, in essence, setting up an annuity, something that pays you for as long as you're alive. Sick people don't set up annuities. An annuity is a bet on how long you're going to live. Since an annuity is a bet on how long you're going to live, it's the reason why, again, sick people don't buy annuities. That means if we think about the, uh, the uh, distribution of, uh, of uh, people's life expectancy as being something like a normal distribution. Uh, these people live a lot longer. These people uh, live shorter. This whole tale of the distribution, most all of it we wipe out because most of these people who are going to die in the next two to three years, let's say, uh, most of these people already have information that they've got a negative diagnosis. They either know they're terminal or they know that they've got some issues. They've got some risk factors, right? Sick people don't buy annuities. People that know they're in this category on the life expectancy uh, sort of uh, uh, distribution, they don't buy annuities. It's one of the reasons why, for example, life insurance companies, they do not use the same life expectancy tables for people who are buying life insurance as compared to people buying annuities because they know sick people don't buy annuities. They have to l use a much longer life expectancy uh, that's somewhere over here, not somewhere here because this tail gets cut off. Okay, so number one, sick people don't buy annuities. Uh, number two, we've got the reality that wealthy people live longer. Uh, we've already looked at some of the demographic realities of that. Beyond this, people with charitable estate plans live longer than others of their same wealth. Now, as I've mentioned before, wealthy people live longer uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, uh, and we can look at some of the data on that, uh, one is that wealthy people have access to uh, all sorts of uh, good things, health care, living where there's good air, lo uh, safe neighborhoods, all of that. But also because fundamentally people that have uh, health uh, related concerns, uh, they are less likely to be able to uh, run uh, effective businesses, get the highest paying jobs, all of those sort of competitive things. So it works both ways. So when we look here, and this is from a national study just showing the average age at which people died in different wealth categories, 
We see that as we move up to wealth, higher wealth categories, people on average live longer. Uh, this study also has whether they have a charitable estate component. And you see these dotted lines. This is for men. Uh, this is those with the charitable component compared to the, to the, the population as a whole. Uh, this is for women. Uh, we see that actually these people live uh, even, uh, even longer. Uh, and so consequently, uh, you put those two things together and what you're going to get is you're going to get a much older age of, uh, of death uh, with people who are wealthy uh, and people who have an interest in uh, making a charitable gift. So wealthy people live longer. Charitable remainder trusts are large transactions uh, conducted only by high net worth individuals. So only wealthy people set these up uh, and uh, only people who are OK with having a charitable estate plan set these up. OK, so what happens when we put all these factors together? Well, the result's pretty extreme. And we actually know about how extreme it is. Uh, there was a really cool study uh, that was uh, uh, that uh, came out a few years ago. Uh, this was just in a uh, uh, in a conference uh, presentation, um, but uh, from that uh, uh, conference proceedings, uh, this was a study that looked at five thousand charitable remainder trusts, just about five thousand charitable remainder trusts, and it looked at the period uh, from 88 to 2006. Uh, just uh, not quite 5,000 unique donors because a handful of them had set up more than one uh, charitable remainder trust. Uh, and uh, there were 601 deaths during this period. So, so this was the information that was used to make this, uh, make this estimation. Uh, a pretty good uh, a pretty good sample given how difficult it is to find these, uh, uh, these people. So what was the result? Well, this example, I think, you know, brings it home. So for example, a 65 year old female donor to a charitable remainder trust would have a life expectancy nearly 10 and a half years longer than the charitable income uh, tax deduction table for a charitable remainder trust. Now, the way to think of it, if a 65 year old female donor funds a charitable remainder trust, the donor will receive a charitable income tax that is overstated by approximately 250%. Why is it so far overstated? It's because these people live much, much longer. They are taking uh, uh, m m a lot more payments. Charity is having to wait a lot longer uh, to uh, get their share, uh, whatever they do happen to get after all of these extra payments are taken out. Uh, the uh, tax deduction is massively overstated. Uh, so then uh, another study uh, showing an a, a interesting result. Uh, this study was looking at uh, and, and this is a professor of finance that uh, did this study. This study was looking at if we have normal life expectancy, and here we're not using the IRS tables for life expectancy because those are stupid. Um, we're not using the more extreme results uh, that um, were actually observed from uh, the uh, data on uh, people who were actually setting up charitable remainder trusts. So this life expectancy, it's not only 10 and a half years longer than the IRS table, it's substantially longer than the uh, annuity uh, user table uh, that the insurance companies uh, use. Uh, so, so for this study, uh, the uh, professor here is using uh, a life expectancy that is the life expectancy for the typical annuity purchaser. In other words, he's using the life expectancy that insurance companies use uh, for people that, that buy annuities. So the question is, if you use not the right life expectancy, but at least a slightly more reasonable life expectancy, if you've got a person who has uh, a appreciated asset, uh, in this case, an asset that has a 20% basis, is it better for them to do a maximum payout charitable remainder unit trust, that is one that, that gives the minimum 10% present value to charity, uh, or uh, is it better for them to just do a direct uh, investment 
That is, sell it, pay the capital gains tax, uh, but keep everything, make no charitable uh, gift. If the person had no charitable intent whatsoever, okay? If they hate charity, or at least they could care less about charity, is it still better for them to use a charitable remainder? Unitrust to fund their retirement uh, if they've got an appreciated asset. So, so that was the empirical question uh, that uh, uh, Professor Yeoman was looking at uh, in this uh, in this analysis. Another way to think of it is this: uh, if you do a charitable remainder trust, uh, you are making a charitable gift, okay, uh, at the end of life or at the end of a period of time. In addition, you're getting a series of tax benefits. Uh, don't have to pay upfront capital gains tax. You get an immediate tax deduction. Uh, your earnings in the meantime are, are tax protected. Okay. So the question for this was essentially if you had somebody who did not want to make a charitable gift, like they don't care about charity at all, was the cost of this charitable gift, was it greater or less than the tax benefits that you get from using a charitable remainder trust. That, that's another way of thinking of what this, uh, what this study did. Uh, so here's how the study was conducted. The study was conducted uh, doing a Monte Carlo simulation of 3 million retirement lifetimes. Now, why do you do it this way? Well, you do it this way because um, we're dealing with uncertainty. We don't know how long the person's going to live. Uh, so the lifespan... Uh, used the annuity purchaser life tables. So that's what that means. Uses the annuity purchaser life tables. But this was not the simple calculation that just says, oh, okay, everybody is going to live up to precisely their, uh, life expectancy under the annuity tables. No, no, no. This actually looked at, uh, with three million retirement lifetimes, uh, actually looking at the distribution of, uh, of life expectancy. Uh, that you would actually observe, which is, you know, again, something that looks like this, where this is right now today. Uh, some people are going to die in the next year or two. Some people are not going to die for 30 uh, years or, more, you know, 40 years or more, whatever, uh, depending on their age. Uh, so this was, uh, this was for an age 60 male, age 55 female. So we say, okay, this is somebody uh, approaching retirement age. So because there are 3 million retirement lifetimes, we're looking at all of these possible ages at death, okay? So in some cases, in some of these retirement lifetimes, uh, people set this up and then they died uh, right away, okay? In some cases, they set this up and then they lived uh, for another 40 years, okay? Uh, so all of these are being observed in these 3 million retirement uh, lifetimes. The other thing that's happening here is that returns are being varied, uh, and that means, uh, and so for that variation, uh, he used the historical large cap standard deviation. Now, what this means uh, is that in some cases, people uh, made this transaction and uh, uh, they, uh, as soon as they uh, uh, put the assets into the charitable remainder trust, uh, the assets went way up uh, and they stayed up, right? In some cases, the assets went way up and then they came down. In some cases, the assets uh, went way down and then they came back up. In some cases, they just stayed flat, right? Basically, just following all the different things that had happened at all the different historical period for uh, large cap, uh, large cap stocks. So the idea here is uh, with uh, three million uh, lifetimes, uh, retirement lifetimes, uh, we can run every single scenario. Every single scenario of, uh, of what's happening uh, with how long the people lived uh, and every single scenario that was living uh, that was uh, depending upon uh, how much, uh, uh, how much uh, return they got. Now, why, why is this important? Well, if you recall, uh, one of the advantages of a charitable remainder trust uh, is that uh, with a charitable remainder trust, um, wh as long as that asset is in the charitable remainder trust, as long as it's in here, there's no taxation in here. The charitable remainder trust is, in fact, a uh, it is a tax-free uh, entity. It is an exempt entity. No taxation taking place in here. Taxes only uh, happen if you pull and when you pull money out of the charitable remainder trust. Well, what that means is that if you get an enormous gain 
in the charitable remainder trust. You know, you invest these assets and the market goes way up, okay? Uh, and then you sell that, you take a big gain, uh, or let's say you have a, a, a maybe high income, um, and apologize, I can't write very well with the, uh, with the mouse here. Uh, so in either case, if you have big gain, big income, no upfront taxes on those things, okay? Uh, taxes don't come until you actually pull it out. Well, so what that means is that if you have a market that creates massive short-term income or massive short-term gains that you sell, if this was not in a tax-free account, you would immediately get hit with taxation on that. But because this is a tax-free account, what that means is that when the market goes way up and you take the that big income or that big gain, you get to keep earning money on all of that. You don't have to have the market go way up and then uh, and then you've got to come back down here because you had to pay taxes uh, and the IRS got their their share of stuff. You know, the IRS takes their chunk out of it. That doesn't happen in a CRT because a CRT is a uh, is a is a tax exempt entity. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why it matters uh, that you uh, need to uh, vary uh, the returns, because if you have big spikes, the charitable remainder trust becomes even more valuable because you're uh, tax protecting those big spikes. Uh, okay, so the uh, theories, uh, so, so the other estimations are uh, for seeing which is the better strategy using a CRT or not using a, a CRT, assuming a 20% basis asset. Uh, that means this is an asset that uh, the person, uh, you, you know, let's just say to keep it simple, uh, shares of stock, they paid uh, 20, uh, Twenty dollars a share for they're now worth a hundred dollars. Okay, so that would be an example of a twenty percent basis asset, uh, and the assumption is that the person is going to consume two point eight percent of the total initial investment. So, for example, if it's uh, selling a ten million dollar business, uh, they're going to consume two point eight percent of that uh, of that ten uh, ten million dollars each year. Okay, so those are the assumptions going in. Uh, so here is uh, what happens, and uh, it's an interesting way that uh, that this was measured, uh, where you've got the direct investment in the one scenario and the maximum payout charitable remainder unit trust in the other scenario. Now, maximum payout means that the charitable gift is at a minimum, meaning it's a 10% present value calculated charitable gift. Okay, With the direct investment, if you sell it, pay, and in this case, it was just federal capital gains tax. Uh, of course, this would be dramatically different if you're in a state that has state capital gains taxes as well, uh, so your capital gains tax rate is higher. You know, if you're in a state like California with 13.3% uh, top capital gains tax rate, this would dramatically make this much, much worse. Um, but uh, so what happens is in the direct investment, uh, the person ran out of money, uh, in 9.9% uh, of the 3 million uh, cases. So that is considered to be, uh, in this case, that's considered to be a, a failure. The person ran out of money. Okay, That happens because of market variations and the person living too long. Right, person lives a really long time. Market does poorly, especially if the market does poorly right at the beginning. 9.9% of the cases, so about 10% of the cases, the regular investment failed. Uh, so just to go back to our scenario, what this means is a person who has a 20% basis asset that uh, pays the capital gains tax up front on that. And um, we have a married couple of this age, and uh, they experience lifespan that matches this table, meaning that um, you know there's all of these different distributions of how long they're going to live. And their returns could vary just as they varied historically with large cap, and they consume 2.8% of the initial investment every year. So again, if their initial asset was a $10 million asset, they're going to consume 2.8% of that every year, um, but they're going to inflation adjust that consumption so their standard of living never changes. Okay, so, so that's the assumption. Now, if they just sell it and pay the capital gains tax, uh, and then invest it, and of course pay taxes on all the the uh, income and, uh, uh, on all of the capital gains that they have with those investments in the, in the meantime. 
this strategy will fail 10% of the time, meaning that 10% of the time in these 3 million retirement lifetimes, 10% of the time, these people are going to run out of money, okay? So that's with the normal investment. Now, with the maximum payout charitable remainder unit trust, that fails 7.9% of the time. Now, here's, here's an important issue. The failure rate is, of course, less, 7.9%, better than 9.9%. So yay, we choose the charitable remainder trust. But there's also a big difference. When this fails, um, this fails because people run out of money. In other words, they're consuming that, uh, that target amount. Uh, and again, that target amount was what? That target amount was 2.8% of the initial investment. Uh, that is adjusted for inflation. That amount they are consuming every year, no matter what. Okay. Now, if you have it just in a regular account, what that means is that you're going to consume that amount every year, no matter what. And the only time that you can't consume that amount is if you're flat broke. Okay. Failure is 9.9% of the time. With the charitable remainder unit trust, failure was when the, the payment coming from the trust fell below that uh, 2.9% um, uh, amount uh, that was inflation adjusted that people that the uh, uh, that um, was the retirement goal. So consequently, even though the failure rate is lower here, Notice that fundamentally, even though both of these are defined as failure, meaning you receive anything less than your uh, target payment, here, if you receive less than your target payment, it's because you ran completely out of money. Here with the charitable remainder unit trust, it's because you got a payment that was somewhat smaller, but you're still getting a payment. So even with that difference in the practical reality of what failure means, uh, even though, you know, uh, yes, failure in both cases is not receiving your full payment amount, but here, uh, the rest of your life means you're flat broke, and here it just means you get a smaller payment. Um, he, uh, even under that difference, charitable remainder trust less likely to fail. Uh, we can look at it in another way. The average present value of the total dollars consumed, so this was the average uh, uh, is uh, uh, 52.88%. Uh, Average present value of uh, the initial dollars consumed, only about 53% uh, here. Why are these so similar? Uh, these are so similar because if the plan doesn't fail, so for 90% of the cases here and for 92% uh, uh, of the cases here, the amount consumed is identical. Why is the amount consumed identical? Because again, um, this is their annual consumption, right? The annual consumption is 2.8% of their initial, say it was $10 million, their initial investment that's inflation adjusted. So if the plan doesn't fail, the consumption uh, that the uh, married couple has will be identical uh, with, uh, with either direct invas investment or uh, the charitable remainder unit trust. Uh, if the plan doesn't fail, it pays exactly this same amount uh, for their lifespan. Okay, so that's why uh, when we look at the average amount that's consumed, the pre the present value of the initial dollars consumed, these are very uh, almost the same because the only time they're going to be different is if the plan fails. So ninety percent or ninety two percent of the time, uh, the the uh, um, the plan's not going to fail, so the consumption is identical. Now, what is different is what's left over for the heirs. So here, what we have is left over is whatever's left over in the bank account, right? So the average um, amount that's left over for heirs, but we're going to take that as a present value, meaning if the heirs have to wait longer than, you know, to, to get the money, then, uh, um, uh, th then, of course, their present value goes down. The average present value of the initial dollars 47% is uh, left for the heirs. Now, notice this weird thing. Average present value of the initial dollars for the heirs, 61% of the initial investment. Here's 47%. Here it's 61%. Now, wait a second. I thought that the way that a charitable remainder trust worked is that 
uh, whatever's left over at death went to the charity, that the heirs are completely cut out. What's this stuff about the heirs getting more under a charitable remainder trust? Well, here's what is, uh, is happening. Because these payments are so much bigger under a charitable remainder trust, why are they bigger? Because they sold this with no capital gains tax, because they don't pay taxes. Uh, this is tax-free growth on growth on growth before it comes out. Okay. So these payments are bigger. P- plus you got a tax deduction. Uh, so you, you got, that's valuable at the beginning. Because these payments are so much bigger and because, uh, under the, uh, uh the, the setup of the scenario, the, uh, uh, the, uh, donors or clients, um, it doesn't matter how big those payments are from the charitable remainder trust. They are actually uh, consuming exactly the same amount. It's always 2.8% of the initial investment that's inflation adjusted. So all of that leftover amount that they're not consuming in the charitable remainder trust, all of that leftover amount goes to who? It goes to the heirs. So in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, regular account, the heirs just get what's whatever's left over in the account. In the charitable remainder trust, uh, there's a separate account for the heirs where they accumulate all of the payments from the charitable remainder trust that they didn't consume. They didn't consume it because they've got a fixed rate of consumption taking place. So what that means is you've got the same amount, essentially a little bit more because the failure rate's less. The same amount for the retirees and a larger amount for the heirs. So if you do a direct investment, uh, you get 52.88% is consumed, uh, present value is consumed by the uh, retirees and the rest goes to the heirs. So you add these up and you go, ah, oh, that's 100%. Right. That makes sense because this is this is just a bank account. Uh, if they uh, you know, if they live a long time, uh, they're going to consume more and the heirs get left if they, if they leave, uh, live a short time, you know, vice versa. But um, the, the account's got to go somewhere. Right. But here we get a little bit larger here and then we get this crazy amount here. So wait a second. These percentages are adding up to more than 100 percent. You're getting more than 100% consumption of the present value of the initial investment. How in the world do you do that? Well, how in the world do you do that is uh, you uh, get all these tax benefits. It's the impact of these tax benefits over time that give us, on average, more than we started with. So that's a little bit about uh, the uh, statistics and demographics of charitable estate planning and plan giving, uh, and in particular, a, a look at one kind of wonky application on how all of these things can affect uh, charitable financial planning using a charitable remainder trust. Uh, well, that's it for now, and uh, thanks for uh, joining uh, this uh, presentation on the statistics and demographics of charitable estate planning and plan giving.